time. Um, but I was rather... Is Rebecca not in the room? OK. I was going to say thanks to the three of you. I'll wait till Rebecca's in. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So the other people I really... I mean, I, I said thanks for me already, but the other people... Uh, I really want to say thanks to uh, the three TAs because they did so much more than I expected them to do. I told them they didn't have to come to any of the lectures and they came to all of them and that turned out to be a really key important part because I was just throwing out examples and they collected them all up. Um, I couldn't have done, I, I'm really, really, I'm almost in tears. I'm really, really grateful to the TAs. Thank you to all of them. Uh, Ela and Jackie and Rebecca, to, to name them explicitly. And I could not, I really couldn't have done it without them. Uh, right, so people write down, I, it took me over six balls to define an automorphic representation, but there's kind of, there's notational cheats, right? So you have G over K, connected reductive, there. And uh, you have H infinity living in G of K infinity, maximal compact. It's this, I, can easy, I can fit it into a few lines, right? An automorphic form, phi, uh, from G of the Adels over G of K to C. Uh, it's just a function. Is a smooth, uh, is a smooth, kind of slowly increasing, there's your boundedness, there's your growth conditions. Is a smooth, slowly increasing, fun, yeah, is a smooth, slowly increasing, H infinity finite, Z finite function. So that's just what people write. So I've just spent the entire last lecture and several lectures before somehow trying to explain what all these words mean. So Z finite, that's the kind of the cool way that people write these things. So Z, of course, Z is the centre of the universal enveloping algebra of the Lie algebra. And uh, Z finite just means you take that typically infinite dimensional algebra of differential operators and you hit, and you hit phi with that entire algebra and you, end, and you only end up with a finite dimensional vector space. And the reason you do is because there's some finite co-dimensional ideal here, which is annihilating phi. So there's an automorphic form. Uh, and we've worked hard to get to that definition, but I'm rather hoping that the way I've presented it, it will somehow stick in your head a bit better than had I just written it down in lecture two. So now we look at the space of all of them. We can look at A of G. It's the phi, which are automorphic forms for G. Uh, and this is, of course, typically hugely infinite dimensional uh, complex vector space. Um, and it has an action, right? This is the whole, do you remember, I was, yesterday I was going on about we really mustn't consider all functions on G of AK because that would be almost like you know, all functions on some finite group G gives you all representations of G, and we're definitely not allowed all representations of G of AK. Uh, so we've got these mysterious functions on G of AK that somehow have some magic property, they're G of K invariant, but all of G of AK still acts, right? Uh, nearly, anyway, right? Uh, if, if this is in, G, is in G of the finite Adels, Uh, then I can, then little g acts on, then can define, then can define an action. Well, that I'm just being, let me, I'm writing things in the wrong order. I'm a bit het up. <laughs> this group here acts on the left on A of G. Right? This, the whole point of this is that this is supposed to be some huge, some huge canonical, massive, infinite dimensional representation of this adelic group, and the components are supposed to be 
automorphic representations. So G of the finite Adels acts on the left in a really obvious way, right? G star phi of gamma is phi of gamma G, right? And if we wrote maps on the right, then this would be obviously seen to be an action. And the reason that I've only put the finite Adels is because there were these smoothness things. You know, if, if that was smooth, then this was smooth. That's fine. Uh, this is staying away from infinity, so this is obviously not going to affect Z finiteness or H infinity finiteness. Unfortunately, G of K infinity doesn't act, right? G of K infinity does not act on this space. And the reason it doesn't act is because uh, you have these compact open subgroups in, uh, in the finite part. And if you conjugate it by some random element of G, you'll get another compact open subgroup whose intersection with your original compact open subgroup had finite index. So you're somehow not losing finiteness ever. But this is some random H infinity, like in the GL2R case, H infinity is just some circle. And when you conjugate by some element of GL2R, it just moves it to a completely different circle. So if you started with a function that was well behaved under some random choice of uh, maximal compact, then when you hit it with an arbitrary element of GL2R, it will now be well behaved under some other choice of maximal compact. And you can't get back to your original one. Uh, because the, basically the problem is if G is in GK infinity, that implies that G H infinity G inverse might not be H infinity in general. So being well behaved under H, as I say, in the finite places this doesn't happen, because if you're well behaved under some finite index subgroup, then when you conjugate, you get something which has finite index in your finite index subgroup, and everything is still finite. So this is supposed to be a massive representation of G of the Adels, but it's not quite. It's a representation of the G of the finite Adels. But although this group really doesn't act, we have a quite a good substitute. Uh, so conjugating elements of H infinity by H infinity works fine. You know, however, H infinity acts just the same definition. I can just let G be an H infinity. Uh, and I'll tell you the other thing that acts is the Lie algebra acts. Right? Curly G is the Lie algebra of G infinity. Uh, Sorry, of G of, I, mean, I should call it GK infinity. So, although the group doesn't act, it's Lie algebra does. Because if I take some rat, because remember the Lie algebra is differential operators. So I take my automorphic form, I hit it with a random differential operator. Is it still Z finite? Yes, it is. Because how does little Z in Z act? Yeah, I've got, if I take some G differential operator here, G phi, Z G phi is G Z phi. You see, this, this is the point. This is the center of these. This commutes with all these differential operators. So if I used to be Z finite and I hit it with a random element of the full Lie algebra, I'm still Z finite. So it's kind of a shame. And there is another way of doing this, right? There's another way. Maybe this is worth remarking. Remark, there's a second way of doing this, right? which I don't really understand. Uh, and, the re and I don't understand it, and it's the reason that I find some of the literature extremely hard to read. There's a second way of doing all this, where, where the automorphic forms, A of G, is just defined to be like the L2 functions on G of K modulo G of AK, possibly with some character or something. And then you don't have this problem, but you also don't have functions, because L2 functions aren't functions. And it's also, you, I mean, this is some kind of Hilbert space or something. And I never liked analysis. So I don't really, I think there is a good reason for sometimes thinking about things like this. Uh, but what I want to stress is two things. Firstly, the answer is different, because this is now a Hilbert space, and G of k infinity really does act. And then you have to kind of start thinking about k, k infinity, h infinity in this context, finite vectors in here. 
and somehow given one of these you can tease out one of my guys and also conversely given one of my guys I think you can take some kind of completion and maybe get these guys but I'm a bit unclear about the relationship between them and somehow what I've learned over the years is that for the kind of questions I'm interested in I don't really need to worry about this so there's some other way of doing it that I don't really understand uh, so when you do it our way, it's nice and algebraic, uh, but you do unfortunately have this problem that you don't actually get an action of g of k infinity. So I kind of want some story, some representations of g. I want to, I want to start decomposing representations into products of local representations, and somehow I'm just going to have to be a little bit careful at infinity, right? So there's some theory. There's something called. There's something called a GK module. Uh, and what lousy... A GK module is a really lousy name for it because it forces you into some notation that in my case I don't want to be in, right? And it's going to be called a GH infinity module. And it's some axiomatic thing. It's a vector space with an action of G and an action of H infinity. So there's a thing. Uh, and... That's what's, you know, we have to, if we're not going to work with L functions, if we're not going to work with L2 functions, then we have to, uh, we have to work with GK modules instead. And this A of G is indeed a G, C, comma, H infinity module. So those of you that really want to understand better what, you see, I'll tell you a secret, I'm not actually that interested in what's happening at infinity. I'm kind of interested in p-adic stuff. Uh, and in fact, maybe I should be interested in what's happening at infinity, because really, what my main aim in life should be, other than being a good father, uh, is that maybe I should be trying to figure out what a piadic analogue of all this stuff is. Maybe I should learn this stuff properly. Maybe you should learn this stuff properly. And then just change all the Cs to Cps, and see if you get it. Uh, so there you go. There's a slightly disappointing aspect of this A of G. But we've got a much worse aspect coming any minute now. Uh, so modulo this issue then. So, so A of G uh, has some action of G of the finite Adels cross something at infinity. Uh, G C comma H infinity. Where by this, I mean, what I mean is this is acting and this is acting. And if you think about it, they're probably acting in some compatible manner, right? If you differentiate the action here, you'll get, you'll get, you know, you'll get the... Uh, there's that. So there's some big group. There's something that isn't quite a group, but it's nearly a group, acting on this massive complex vector space, right? So an automorphic representation... pi for g is an irreducible subquotient, right? It's an irreducible subquotient of A of g. So as far as I'm concerned, the biggest problem with this definition is that I have absolutely no idea what it means. Uh, so, I know what an irreducible... I mean, I'm a bit surprised I don't know what it means because I thought I knew what an irreducible subquotient was. Like, you've got G acting on some massive vector space V, and then V maybe contains V1, that's G stable, maybe contains V2, that's G stable, both G stable. So V1 has an action of G, V2 is a G invariant sub, so you do the quotient, right? V1 over V2, that has an induced action of G, and that's a subquotient. It's a subquotient of V, right? That looks like a really good definition of subquotient. It's like a sub of a quotient, or a quotient of a sub. Uh, 
yeah, I should, if I mod it out by V2 first, then V over V2 would have a sub V1 over V2. So it really would be a sub of a quotient. So that's the definition of sub quotient that I carry around in my brain. And when I apply that definition to this, I get the wrong answer, right? It doesn't mean this. Okay, it means something to do with Fourier theory. Uh, and it's all, I might go to my grave not knowing what an automorphic representation is. And I think, let me just vaguely tell you my vague understanding of the issues. Uh, if I'm looking at L2 functions on the reals, then that has an action of the reals, right? Just like L2 functions on G as an action of G. So, L2, so I've got some F from R to C, right? And I've got some real number, I've got some real number R. I can define R star F of X, just to be F of X plus R. Right, we've been continually doing that in this course. We've been looking at functions on a group, and we've been letting the group act. Okay? So now I've got a representation of the real numbers on L2 of R. And I kind of like to decompose that representation into irreducible representations. And we could look at the irreducible, like, you know, there's a space. Let's look at the irreducible subquotients of this representation. You see? Uh, so it would be interesting to see some... Um, Irreducible subquotients of a representation of an abelian group, they should probably be one dimensional. So in L2R, I want to find a nice one dimensional subspace or a subquotient where R is acting via some character. So let's think of a character of R. Uh, so what about here? Here's a, here's a map from R to C star. Let's send X to, I don't know, E to the I, X, Y, with Y a real number, right? There's a nice, U, so, so I'll fix a Y. Let's fix Y, okay? Y is a real number, it's fixed. And then I'm going to look at the map from R to C star, sending X to E to the I, X, Y. Uh, and what, so let me, call that, let me call that phi Y, okay? And the reason I'm interested in phi Y is if you think about it, kind of R star phi Y. Uh, R star phi y, uh, let me do this in my head. R star phi y is f of x plus r, x plus r, e to the i, e to the i, r, y uh, times phi y, isn't it? You see, so somehow, uh, so phi y kind of looks, you know, phi y is an eigenvector, and that's the eigenvalue. Uh, so I kind of want this to be a subquotient, right? And somehow the theory of Fourier transforms says that f is built from functions that look like this, right? f is some kind of integral of functions, whatever, c of y, kind, c of y times phi of y, right? Where these are the Fourier coefficients. I mean, that's, that's, there's some integral. Uh, and so you would imagine that I'm saying every function can be built from functions like phi y, and so maybe these phi y's are somehow the irreducible constituents of this. But this phi y uh, is not in this space, right? So phi y, phi y of x is 1 for all x, right? So therefore phi of y is not in L2, because L2 is in some integrals that are supposed to converge. And that, no way is any integral attached to that converging. So this function is supposed to be a subquotient of this representation, and the proof is supposed to be some version of Fourier theory. But for general G, that's, I mean, you can imagine that some generalization works. But I've never understood it properly. Uh, and this is the problem with A of G, is that some chunk of it is some big, Infinite, fam infinite continuous family of representations, uh, which you're somehow supposed to be able to pull off via some theory of irreducible subquotients. So I can't figure out how to make this, in any reasonable sense, a subquotient of that vector space, uh, which is kind of a shame. But I know a fix, you see. 
So I'm going to tell you about cuspid automorphic representations. So here's a fix. Okay, I need two. I need to introduce two new concepts. Okay, need two things. Need two things. So firstly, we say an automorphic representation is cuspidal if some other growth conditions, right? So you know what it means for a modular form to be a cusp form. It means that some constant terms are zero. So there is some story, right? And I'm not going to tell you the story. It's about, it looks like this, where n is, the n is some unipotent radical, n of k over n of ak. Okay, n is some, I mean, m times n is p, p some maximal proper parabolic. There's a definition. It's kind of useless, uh, but let me just kind of. So these are the, that's the tedious boundary conditions, right? Maximal proper boundary, po huh? Yeah, that integral is zero. Thank you. You can see I'm very disconnected from this integral. Uh, let me just make some comments, rather than explaining what an adelic integral looks like. Let me make some comments on this definition. If G is GL2 over Q, then the maximal proper parabolic subgroups of G defined over Q, uh, maximal proper parabolics, of the conjugates of B, right, which is star, star, zero, star. And the conjugates of a group is G modulo the normalizer of a group, and the normalizer in G of B is B again. So the set of conjugates of B is G modulo N, is G modulo B, and that's isomorphic to P1 of Q. And so this condition for, cusp for cuspidality, in the case of GL2 over Q, it says for every point in projective one space over Q, something is zero. And that's exactly what the definition of a cusp form is for a modular form, right? The cusps of P1 of Q, and you say that something is, you see an N of K, what is this N? N, B, B is star, star, zero, star, B is M times N, N is one star, zero, star. No, 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 N is one star, zero, one. And so, so N is isomorphic to affi in one space. So N of K modulo N of, I mean, N, N of Q, modulo n of aq, as I've been trying to argue, and that looks a bit like n of z modulo n of r. It's just some fancy generalized version of that. And so this is kind of r mod z. And so this funny definition of some integral that I'm not going to explain properly says that for every element of p1 of q, I do some integral round a circle, and I get zero. And the integral round the circle, of course, all the higher order coefficients of the modular form just cancel out. Uh, and you're left with the constant term that doesn't move at all, and it gets multiplied by the volume of r mod z, which is probably 1. So you're demanding that the constant term is zero. So there's fix 1. Uh, we define what it means for a form to be cuspidal. And fix 2. Uh, is there's an issue with central characters. So for some technical reason, uh, I'll tell you the technical reason. Let me let you into a secret. This is why people do central characters. I work really hard to, um, to come up with this crazy differential operator thing, right? And I said, oh, look, isn't this good? x goes through x to the power s. We now have some very clever way of thinking about this. It's some uh, kernel of d minus s. Right? And I just said in general, it's really good. We need, to consider, we need to consider functions which are annihilated by some finite co-dimension ideal in this thing. Right? But here's a problem. See, there's our ring of differential operators. And it contains the ideal d minus s squared. Right? That's got finite co-dimension. So I'm completely allowed to have automorphic representations uh, 
which are annihilated by d minus s squared. So here's a sort of fun exercise. If x goes to x to the power s times log x, this is sort of resonance. If x goes to x to the power s times log x, that's some function from the positive reals to c star. Uh, if that's f of x, then d minus s squared times f is 0. So we've got some kind of extra random things that aren't quite, uh, that aren't quite, you see, so we could look at the space spanned by x goes to x to the power s, and x goes to x to the power s times log x, and both of those functions are in the kernel of these differential operators, and they give me a two-dimensional vector space on which r star acts non-semi-simply, right? Uh, so we're kind of getting extra stuff. I mean, it's just a bit silly. Uh, I mean, if, we, if R star is actually non-semi-simply, then, I mean, in this situation, what's happening is we're getting the eigenspaces we want, and then we're just getting some sort of silly generalized eigenspaces that aren't giving us any new information. So I just want to fix this by letting the center act in a certain way. So there's my first, my first fix. I need cuspidality. And then secondly... Let's say Z is the center of G. Okay. So as a general phenomenon in mathematics, if a group acts on something irreducibly, then the center will act by scalars. And we're interested in automorphic representations, which are irreducible subquotients of A of G. And even though we don't really know what that means, uh, if it's an irreducible subquotient, then somehow the center should be acting uh, in some, in some scalar way. So let's say Z is the center of G. And you see the problem with this is that here, the center is acting via some character. Here, there's a, uh, like there, that's a character. That's a character of R star. That's not a character. That's some kind of, some slightly annoying thing. So let me just demand that the center acts by a character. Okay. We'll say, let's fix, uh, let's fix some psi from Z of the Adels over Z of K to C star. Right, so the centre is, is not a big mystery, right? E.g. G is GLN, Z is just isomorphic to GL1, right? It's the scalar matrices. So let's fix some Z, uh, let's fix some character of the centre, okay? And now let's just consider, let's just consider functions uh, which transform that way under the center. So we've defined A of G, and I've told you my deficiencies in understanding it. Let me define A zero G, oh, comma, that, right? That means cuspidal. I'm just explaining the notation. That means center axis via psi. So let me write down the definition then. So it's the nice phi, phi in A of G, such that phi is cuspidal. So we have some integrals vanishing. And, uh, and phi of GZ is psi of z times phi of g for all z in the center, uh, for all z in the center, the idyllic points, right? And g in the group. So there's a modified collection of automorphic forms uh, where I've thrown out annoying things like x to the s log x, which give us semi-simplicity. And I've also thrown out a whole bunch of stuff that wasn't bounded enough, okay? And that splits up as an infinite direct sum. And so I understand what's going on now. A cuspidal automorphic representation pi of G, oh, no, not GLN, of G of the Adels 
of k is an irreducible sub-representation. of this thing here, of A, zero, G, comma, psi, the sum psi. So there's no issue about irreducible subquotients. Irreducible subrepresentation means exactly, well, maybe, maybe, let me say, I think people might like this, is a representation pi, which is isomorphic to, right? I think that's what people really want the definition to be nowadays. So it's an abstract representation pi, but it happens to be isomorphic to a sub-representation of this. Uh, so now you can just think of them abstractly in representation theory terms, knowing that somewhere along the line, somebody has written down a bunch of explicit nice functions on G, uh, such that your action, uh, such that your action is somehow isomorphic to the thing you're thinking of. So that is a genuine definition. Uh, I mean, I haven't quite said about, I haven't, you know, at infinity we just have some, not quite some action of, there's some lie here, right? You know, the, strictly speaking, this would be G of the finite Adels, right? Cross G, cross whatever, H infinity, right? That's really, that's really what's acting. Uh, so there's the definition. And uh, it seems, a sh well, the central character is just sort of silly because every irreducible representation, the center will act by a character. That's just, that's how life works. But the cuspidality thing, you should be a little bit concerned, right? Because somehow A of G, I wanted A of G, there is a definition of an automorphic representation even though I don't understand it. And we've just thrown away a whole bunch of automorphic representations that aren't cuspidal, right? So there's a theorem of Langlands. Is that it says that if pi is an automorphic representation which isn't cut, so I don't understand the statement of this theorem, right? If pi is an automorphic representation of G that is not cuspidal, then pi isn't very interesting. <laughs> so then that's fine. Then pi. That's not remotely true. Pi, is, pi can absolutely be very interesting. Uh, but in terms of representation theory, I can explain pi. I mean, yeah, this is somehow a subtle point. Maybe the representation is interesting, but maybe the functions are interesting. So it's somehow, anyway, if pi is an automatic representation that isn't cuspidal, uh, then pi is somehow isomorphic to some sort of induced representation from P to G of some pi zero, where pi zero is cuspidal on some smaller group, on some smaller group. I'm not going to make that rigorous. There's no point making it rigorous, because I don't even know what an automorphic representation is. This theory of Langland says it doesn't matter that you don't know what an automorphic representation is. This theory of Langland says, for some, well, if you're me, this theory of Langland says that for certain purposes, if you're interested in understanding automorphic representations, then you might want to strongly consider understanding cuspidal automorphic representations, and then if push comes to shove, you can somehow claim that Langland's constructed some machine that given cuspidal automorphic representations on some groups gave you automorphic representations on other groups, right? So here's an example. The idea is, if I look at GL1, if G is GL1 cross GL1, <laughs> then an automorphic representation for G and a cuspidal automorphic representation for G, just a pair of Grossen characters, right? Then an automorphic, uh, then a, they're even cuspidal, because there's no, yeah, I wrote down the definition of cuspidal, it was kind of incomprehensible, but it involved proper parabolic subgroups, and there aren't any in this case. So then a cuspidal automorphic representation for G, it's just a pair of Grosser characters, chi1, comma chi2, of Grosser characters. Okay? So if G is GL, GL1 cross GL1 is a subgroup of GL2, and we're about to see, 
So we're about to see how we can move from this to this. Some kind of I of chi 1 comma chi 2, which when we talked about them in the local setting, well, it turns out there's a global analog there. And that's going to be some non-cuspidal automorphic representation of GL2. You see, we saw this locally. I'm saying the same story works globally, but I'm reluctant to start explaining it because I have no interest in it. So there, I know that people in the audience do. That's not to say it's not interesting. It's just to say that you have to stop somewhere. Uh, so globally, you can somehow induce things. And this gives me a non-cuspidal automorphic representation of GL2. And what I claim is uh, what Langlands is showing, Langlands, every automorphic representation of GL2 is either cuspidal or it's of that form or built in this way. And there are kind of interesting subtleties. You know, just like locally, this wasn't always irreducible. This might not be irreducible. So maybe this is actually a lie. Maybe I should say the subquotients. You know, maybe I should say the subquotients. The subquotients of this, because maybe you know it's some complicated thing, a non cuspidal automorphic representations of GL two. You know, if you choose two random Grossing characters, it will be irreducible. But there are other cases uh, when it's not. So because of this vague idea that automorphic representations for G are either cuspidal or they've come from some smaller group, uh, we should perhaps stick to cuspidal things. Uh, so this is this random, you've heard of cusp forms, so now you've heard of cuspidal automorphic representations, and you might wonder how they fit into the global Langlands philosophy of things, right? So global Langlands conjectures. The global Langlands conjectures for GLN, let's just say. Maybe I should say, I thought the cuspidal was a really important thing once. But now I've realized the only reason the cuspidal is important is if I put it in, then it means I can understand the definition. Uh, I used to think that cuspidal was much more important. And I think that somehow I'm wrong. And for a general G, the important things are the discrete series, the things that do actually show up as subs in here. Uh, but let me tell you what global Langlands for GLN looks like. Uh, so I want to make statements about automorphic representations, but I can't because I don't know what they are. So for GLN over K, it says that cuspidal automorphic representations for GLN over K. So I've defined them. Those are the things I actually know how to define. Uh, those should be in some kind of bijection with irreducible n-dimensional representations of the lie. So there's the dream conjecture. I've said a lot of bad things about this conjecture. At the very end, I'm going to tell you why that conjecture's uh, of any use at all. And then this global Langlands group, nobody knows what it is. If I fix some prime p, then these global automorphic representation, whatever, you know, maybe I could call that pi. Maybe pi is some tensor product. Pi is, because it's irreducible, it's going to be some, maybe some tensor product of pi p, tensor pi infinity. And uh, that pi p there, via some local Langlands conjectures, should match up with some rho p, which is some local Vedelin representation, right? Uh, to whatever, to GLN of C. And the, that Vedelin thing that isn't even a group, that should somehow maybe be, I mean, this has no definition. This is something about what's going on, right? So there's a very, very vague conjecture that we don't really know how to make any sense of. But the point is, the reason I'm explicitly flagging it is we've got this new idea on the left-hand side. We've got cuspidal representations. And I just want to point out that they're supposed to fit into the picture like this. They correspond to irreducible representations here. And you see this theorem of Langlands, which is very hard, whose proof is very hard analysis, uh, 
This is the point. This is something that really needs to be said, and I'm going to say it now. What's written on the board there is something that throughout this course I've been arguing is a complete load of rubbish. It's a meaningless statement because it involves a group whose definition we don't know. Okay? But there's a theorem that's true about groups, uh, even if they're groups that we don't know the definition of. So I've got a semi-simple representation of a group. It's a direct sum of irreducible representations. Right? Fact. Semi-simple representation of a group. That equals a direct sum of irreducible representations. And if you're wondering why that's true, that's because that's the definition of semi-simple. And so maybe semi-simple representations of this Langlands group should correspond to arbitrary automorphic representations. But semi-simple representations are built up from irreducible representations of smaller dimension. Right? So on that side, we make the trivial observation that a semi-simple representation of a group is the direct sum of irreducible representations. And if we believe this philosophy, then we, then we should deduce that non-cuspidal automorphic representations, right? So by Langland's conjectures, by, our, by philosophy, that trivial observation should, by a deep philosophy, imply that automorphic representations can be built from cuspidal, from cuspidal automorphic representations. on smaller groups. And that's a deep theorem of Langlands. So this is a trivial observation. And this is a, and this is a, this is a profound theorem. This is hard analysis. Theorem of Langlands. So that's why this dream is important, is because it's telling us what to prove on this side. This side, nothing has any definition. This side, we have a definition now. Well, we don't quite, <laughs> but uh, I mean, there, there is a definition, I just don't know it. Uh, and this trivial observation here becomes a profound theorem of language. Well, it's not profound, I mean, it's very hard analysis, that's all. It's just harmonic analysis. Uh, Which is kind of suddenly, I don't know, it motivates, it motivates the dream a bit better, right? I think now it's maybe time to build an automorphic time to build an automorphic form. Blah blah blah. Done all that. Done all that. Done all that. I should maybe tell you what this is called. Uh, this is called reciprocity, right? This is called Langland's. Reciprocity. Okay? And what happened is that Langlands reciprocity in that formulation is kind of a dream, but it inspired us, this trivial observation about groups here inspired us to prove a hard theorem here. So what's happening uh, is that somehow this is an instance of Langlands functoriality. And the reason is, if I have a, a representation on the right-hand side, which is a direct sum of two irreducible representations, then that means I've got two automorphic representations of some smaller groups, and I need to somehow induce them up and get a non-cuspidal automorphic representation of my bigger group. Uh, and that's an instance of functoriality. Functoriality means doing a really trivial thing on the group theory side that doesn't exist, translating it over, working out a corresponding statement about automorphic representations, and then working really, really hard and uh, doing lots of functional analysis and proving it. That's what, func that's what functoriality does, right? So sort of general, uh, maybe I should say that while we're here, right? In general, Reciprocity is something that can't be formulated, right? Reciprocity is a philosophy, right? And functoriality equals concrete consequences 
that make sense. Because they only apply on one side. So let me just give me one, let me give you another example, right? Second and last example. Uh, I can take the symmetric square of a two dimensional representation, right? If I've got pi, some automorphic representation of GL2 over K, okay? By philosophy, pi gives rise to rho from the non existent global Langlands group to GL2 of the complexes, okay? There's by our philosophy or reciprocity. And now I've got a two dimensional representation of a group. I can take symmetric square, right? Sim squared rho. That's now a three dimensional representation. So by philosophy, implies that there should exist some sim squared pi. Uh, Pi was an automorphic representation of GL2 over K. That should be an automorphic representation of GL3 over K. And the interesting thing is that this conjecture construction from pi to sim squared of pi makes sense because it's all taking place in the world where I've defined everything. And in fact, symmetric square of an irreducible representation is almost always irreducible. So if pi is cuspidal, then you would expect sim squared pi almost always to be cuspidal, unless there's some you know, very special uh, set of conditions which are occurring. Uh, basically, for that not to be the case, this would have to be induced from some index 2 subgroup. So this means, given a cuspidal automorphic representation for GL2, I should be able to construct a cuspidal automorphic representation for GL3. Now, if you think about what that actually entails, that says, given, a, given some nice functions on GL2 of the reals, I'm expected to come up with some nice functions on GL3 of the reals. So you can see that's really a profound statement, right? So that does exist, right? Sim squared, sim squared pi does exist, and I'm ashamed to say I don't know who constructed it, uh, but this is a hard theorem in functional analysis. I'm doing it again, I'm just kind of waffling. I mean, I should really have looked up who proved that, but uh, because I'm just making it up on the spot, I didn't know I was going to say it. Uh, so that's the point of functoriality. No, it's the point of reciprocity. Even though, it's a, even though it's a dream, it inspires functoriality, and functoriality is meaningful, difficult questions about constructing automorphic forms. Uh, so we need to have some tricks for constructing automorphic forms. So I think I'm going to finish by telling you how to do it. So let's have an example of an automorphic form for GL2 over Q, my favorite group. Uh, well, let's start with a modular form. Well, let me just remind you let me remind you of some notation. Reminder of notation. If I've got some function on the upper half plane, any function, I mean, it's going to be holomorphic because it's going to be a modular form in a minute. Uh, but say I've got some function on the upper half plane, some function. Uh, and let's say I've got k an integer. Uh, and let's say I've got gamma equals A, B, C, D in GL2 plus of R. Uh, I want to define, define F hit by K gamma. That's also a function on the upper half plane. So this is notation you see uh, in the theory of modular forms by F hit by K gamma. This is really important that I give this definition because every person has a different version. Uh, and this is the issue. It's debt gamma to some power. And you can choose any power you like. Let me choose K minus 1 because my advisor chose K minus 1. And uh, so I'm going to choose K minus 1. Uh, 
Cz plus d, C tau plus d to the minus k times f of gamma tau. So a modular form is a function with some boundedness conditions uh, that's invariant under this action for some discrete group. So there's my modular form, and it's kind of my job, really, to build an automorphic form from this modular form. And uh, I worked out how to do this once and wrote it up and stuck it on the internet. And you can go and look at the details if you like. Uh, so let's say F is a, let's say now F is a cuspidal modular form. of level n and weight k. Okay, and all that means is that i.e. f hit by gamma is equal to f for all gamma in gamma 1 of n, which is the matrices, which is star star 0, 1 mod n, uh, plus some boring boundedness conditions, plus some boundedness conditions. Right, so it's a function on the upper half plane. Uh, so, do you remember when I was doing GL1 earlier this week, I started with a Dirichlet character and a random complex number S, because you could always twist by norm to the S. So what I'm going to start with here, let's start with, let's say we have modular form, a cusp form, a cuspidal modular form, f, and a complex number, s. Let's build a phi. And then when you see how easy it is to build a phi, you'll realize that actually building automorphic forms isn't really that difficult. And, uh, you know, maybe given some explicit family of Gower representations, maybe you want to go away and build your own. Maybe you want to build your own automorphic form. Because uh, at the end of the day, it's kind of a very concrete question. Uh, so here's what we do. I need some function on GL2 of the Adels. I need to define some function on GL2 of the Adels of Q to C. And this is kind of crappy because it's not a proper product, and so it's difficult to get your hands on things, right? So do you remember, we proved the following. Uh, we proved the following things over the, last few, over the last few days and weeks. We proved that GL2 of QP uh, was B of QP times GL2 of ZP. B is the upper triangular matrices. We proved that. Uh, and it's really obvious. We didn't prove this because it's obvious. GL2 of ZP is the number 1 times GL2 of ZP. And the reason I mention this is because now we can put things together for all primes P at once. And we can deduce that GL2 of the finite Adels which is just a bunch of GL2QPs, such that all but finally many are in GL2ZPs. So there, that means a bunch of B of QPs, such that all but finally many are in B of ZP, which is one, because they're one. Uh, so that, I think, turns into B of the finite Adels. And then GL2 of ZP just turns into GL2 of ZP. So we get GL2 of Z hat. That's kind of nice, because uh, we're nearly there. B of AF is a bit terrifying, though. But do you remember, we proved that Q star, no, we proved that A, Q, F, we proved the finite Adels of Q. I'm just going to call them AF. I'm going to drop Qs. We proved that AF was Q plus Z hat. And we proved that AF star was Q star times Z hat star. And B of AF, when you think about it, it's just AF star 
AF star AF zero. So because I can build things in here from things in Q and things in Z hat, it's very easy to deduce that GL2 of AF is actually just B of Q times GL2 of Z hat because it's B of Q times B of Z hat times GL2 of Z hat. So we really, this is kind of getting even better because we nearly have kind of a quotes formula for an element of GL2 of the Adels. The one problem is I don't want to really stick to level one. I've got a form of level N. So then the last trick, if I've got U, this finite U, is U1 of N, right? Which is the matrices in GL2 of Z, of Z hat, such that M is congruent to star star 0, 1, modulo N. Then U, that somehow looks like the right level, because it looks like an adelic analog of gamma 1 of N. And you see, I've got GL2 of Z hat, which kind of looks like level 1. Uh, then GL2 of Z hat... equals a disjoint union of cosets of UF. And these are just gamma I tildes, where gamma I tilde uh, lifts gamma I. When you think about it, this is stuff, this is defined by some congruence mod N. So gamma I tilde lifts gamma I, which are cosets for everything mod N. So mod N, we have star star zero one here. Gamma I are going to be cosets for star star zero one living in GL2 of Z mod NZ. So mod N, we have GL2 of Z mod NZ, and then star star zero one. That's like my U1 of N thing, but I've modded everything out by N. So I get cosets there, and I lift the cosets to here. And all those cosets, I can just assume that the gamma I tilde are in GL2 of Q. Because these cosets, are just, I mean, they just, I take some random, when you think about it, what's my gamma I tilde? It's a random two by two matrix with coefficients mod n, whose determinants non zero mod n. So I just lift all the entries to random integers, and now I've got coefficients in the integers, determinants non zero mod n, so it's definitely non zero. So these lift to GL2 of Q. And I've done something really cool here over a very short period. What have I done? I've got this group here. I've just proved, hence, GL2 of the finite Adels seems to me I've got B of Q. I'm just going to change that to GL2 of Q. And then I've got this GL2 of Z hat, but I don't want that now. I want UF. And I've got these random elements, gamma I tilde, but they all live in GL2 of Q anyway, so I can swallow them in. So I've got this U1 of N. That's all I need. Oh, and I just remarked that 1, 1, 0, 0, negative 1 is in GL2 of Q. Uh, and hence, GL2 of the Adels, last theorem of the course, is GL2 of Q, U1 of N, GL2 plus of R. So now finally, I've got some coordinates on GL2 of A. A random element of GL2 of the Adels is an element in GL2 of Q times some random thing in my compact open times a good old matrix, a two by two real matrix with positive determinant. So my job is to define a function on this attached to my modular form F and my complex number S, right? So given, given F and S as before, let's define phi from GL2 of Q modulo GL2 of the Adels to C. And the definition is, uh, hopefully, written down on this piece of paper. It is. Great. By phi of... There's a gamma, and there's a U. Uh, 
And there is an H. H is going to be what's happening at infinity. So that gamma is, of course, in GL2 of Q. And that U is going to be in U1 of N. And that H is a matrix in GL2 plus of R. So I'm going to define phi on gamma UH. I'm just going to write down some formula. It's not going to mention gamma, but that's OK, because it's supposed to be constant on cosets of GL2Q. It's not going to mention U either, but that's kind of OK, because an automorphic form is supposed to be constant on cos It's supposed to be like locally constant. So I'm going to make it locally constant by making phi not depend on U. So it's only going to depend on H, which is a matrix in GL2 plus of R. And it looks like this. It's, take my modular form F. Hit it with H. I explain what that was. It's gone. It's not gone. It's gone. Uh, take my modular form. Hit it with this. That's still a function from the upper half plane to the complexes. Evaluate it at I. And now I've got this S. And the S is supposed to be some just norm to the S. How am I going to do norm? I'm going to do det H to the power S. There it is. So there's phi, and my claim is, is that phi is in A of G, for G is GL2. Uh, but the proof of that is mostly trivial. Uh, in fact, the main issue really is I should check that phi is well-defined. Let's check phi is well-defined. Uh, and you see, the issue here is that I just did some mucking around with group theory and proved that this is this times this times this. But there might be more than one. This is the problem. What about if G is gamma UH and gamma prime U prime H prime? Then I've made some definition, and it only depended on H. But if I change H to H prime, there might be an issue, right? So let me just check that. Uh, note that if gamma 1 U1 H1, with obvious notation, equals gamma 2 U2 H2, then that implies that gamma 2 inverse gamma 1 is U2 H2 H1 inverse U1 inverse. And whatever this thing is on the right, uh, I know that the finite part is in U1 of N, and I know that the infinite part is in GL2 plus of R. So there is some ambiguity, maybe. But on the right-hand side, it's in this. And on the left-hand side, that's in GL2 of Q. So I've got a matrix in GL2 of Q that's in GL2 of Z hat. So it's in GL2 of Z. It's got positive determinant. So it's in SL2 of Z. And it's common to star star 0, 1, modulo n. So this is gamma 1 of n. And that's exactly the group that uh, F behaves well under. And so lo and behold, you see that, uh, and therefore, H2, H1 inverse is some gamma infinity in gamma 1 of n. And so I can see that H2 is gamma infinity H1, where gamma infinity is in gamma 1 of n. And if you look at the definition, if I change H to gamma infinity times H, you see, an F hit by K gamma infinity H1 is indeed F hit by K of H1. You see, and that's F hit by K of H2. So I did use the fact that it was a modular form, but in quite a secret way that it's very difficult to spot. But it does get used. So phi is well defined. Uh, phi is GL2, GL2 of Q invariant. That's obvious. Uh, U1 of n finite, that's obvious. K infinity finite, H infinity finite. I guess that needs checking. I should just check uh, that if I replace H by cos theta sine theta minus sine theta cos theta, then, hmm. So I better check, I better, given a modular form, I'll hit it with K, I better hit it with cos theta minus sine theta, sine theta, cos theta. Uh, and I need to evaluate that at I. Uh, and this is, let me remember the definition. It's debt to the something, the debt is 1, times Cz plus D, 
<laughs> C tor plus D. C tor plus D is sine theta times I plus cos theta to the power of minus K there times, times F of I, isn't it? Because that's just I again. So there's some weird... This is funny. This is slightly different. So F isn't invariant under H infinity. There's some little twist, right? So the axiom is still true. The space band is still one-dimensional, uh, at least by SO2R. But um, it doesn't act trivially. There's a funny little twist. So that's going to twist our uh, differential operator. But it's OK. It's still finite. right? So that implies that phi is H infinity finite. OK? Of course, Cauchy-Riemann equations, F is holomorphic. Right? That implies that... Uh, you know, it's an eigenform. It's an eigenform for this Laplacian there. And then the centre, Z acts by some formula involving S. In fact, why don't I tell you what that formula is? Because uh, I've got it written down here. Uh, let me tell you the, uh, let me tell you the actual answers. Uh, it turns out that uh, hmm, chalk doesn't taste very nice. It turns out that nabla of phi is k squared minus 2k. It's not zero, even though f was holomorphic, because I showed that for holomorphic functions, which were invariant under h infinity. You see, if, if this was a weight zero modular form, that wouldn't be there, and I would expect phi to be zero, but lo and behold, if it's a weight zero module, I mean, if k is zero, that's zero anyway. k squared minus 2k, fine. And uh, z phi turns out to be 2s plus k minus 2 phi. So given a modular form f, uh, and a complex number S, I get an automorphic form, phi. And now look at the GL2 Adels of K representation spanned by phi. Right? And I want that to be the automorphic representation attached to phi. Uh, uh, is the automorphic representation attached to F. So I suppose in this generality, it's not quite an automorphic representation because it might not be irreducible. If I just choose a random f, it might not be irreducible. But if I let f be a, an eigenform, f is an eigenform, that implies that pi is irreducible. And there it is. That's the cuspidal automorphic representation. attached to F. And so now we see Deligne's theorem is really a special case of the part of Langland's reciprocity uh, that we actually believe. The Eladic Gower representation is attached to uh, I don't know. It all adds up. All right, I'm finished. Thank you. <laughs> I got there in the end. Any questions? Hello. If I had an eigenform, I just showed you, given F, I made a phi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Given an F, I made a phi. And now given a phi, I, yeah, given a modular form, I made a phi. And now given that phi, I just hit it with all of these things here, which are acting on that space called phi. I get a massive infinite dimensional representation attached to the modular form. Like, who knew? And that turns out, what my argument is, is that that's the canonical object. Right? And I will remark that people often talk about the modular form, the automorphic representation attached to a modular form. But when I unraveled it, it's just a sort of silly point, but when I unraveled it, it turned out you needed a pair F and F. <laughs> so it's just a, just a remark. And so it turns out that the following is a theorem when two people say the automorphic representation attached to modular form, they might not mean the same thing. Because they might have different choices of action. Uh, yeah, I guess, yeah. But I mean, I wouldn't worry, I wouldn't stress too much about the passage.
Because I would say that Laplace is not a canonical operator, right? I mean, C of triangle comma Z is also equal to C of triangle minus 53 comma Z, right? And so now it's got eigenvalue 53. I don't really, I don't really know how much weight to put on these things. Uh, I mean, I just did some calculation. That was what came. Out. For general automorphic representation, you might wonder what it means to be algebraic, because those are the ones for which we actually have a proper reciprocity convention. And that just basically means that these have to be whole numbers. Right? You, there's a really nice conceptual way of thinking about it, where you think of these triangle and Z as somehow living in some Lie algebra of some torus. And, uh, but the point is these, these Lie algebras of tori have canonical lattices in, coming from representations of the actual torus itself. So algebraic just means these eigenvalues are living in these lattices. So it's not kind of a big thing. So all you have to do now is generalize it to GL3. Right? So, so here's why it's kind of hard to generalize it to GL3. It's for GL2, the Lean's axis are satisfied. The upper half plane modulo a lattice is a complex Riemann surface that happens to be an algebraic curve over a number field. So you take the cohomology of that algebraic curve and you might find your representations. You do this for GL3, you end up with some GL3 analog of the upper half plane. It's a five-dimensional real manifold. So there's no, there's no, you can quotient out by GL3 of Z, sure, then you get some random five-dimensional manifold. It's not an algebraic variety of the complex. That's why it's hard. We've got all day. Any more, any more questions? Are we all just going home now, or are we going to stay around for the afternoon? Uh, can you, like, I'm quite happy to stay around for the afternoon. Are people going to stay around for the afternoon? Uh -huh. Are we meeting in Jupiter at 7.30? What time do I say? Yes. Okay, that's the last thing I have to say. I'll see some of you there. Thanks for coming.